When the Buddha started out teaching, he didn't say that he was going to teach people Buddhism. He told the five brethren that he would teach them the Dharma. And Dharma basically meant doctrine. Which doctrine? Doctrine for putting into suffering and stress. His criticism of other paths was that they didn't lead to the end of suffering. Was the Noble Eightfold Path led to the end of suffering and led to awakening? Led to knowledge. And then he plunged right in to teach the path. He didn't tell them they could become stream enterers or once returners or non returners or ions. He basically said, This is the path for putting an end to suffering. And you focus on the suffering that you're doing right now. Notice that you're doing it. You're clinging to things. It's not that you're simply on the receiving end of the suffering. You're doing it. And you want to see that. Comprehend that. And then you can see what's causing the suffering. So that you can put an end to it. And there's a path to follow. In fact, the path was the first thing you mentioned. It was a path of action. That's all. And so in speaking about suffering, he was speaking to something that was very immediate to all of his listeners. Something that's happening right there in the present moment. The word dukkha, we translate it as suffering, but it also means stress and everything between just subtle stress to really out and out misery. It's all the same word in Pali. But as you pointed out another time, this is something that's been with us for a long time. And our problem is we're bewildered by it. We don't know where it's coming from, why it's happening. We want a way out. So what he was offering was a way out, offering to end their bewilderment, giving them a way to understand the suffering so they could put an end to it. All very direct, very immediate. And it's good as we practice that we try not to anticipate too much, and then we look instead at what we're doing right now to create suffering. And John Fung said that of the students he taught, the ones he liked best were the Chinese merchants from the, the market, because they hadn't read much of anything in the Dharma. They didn't have a lot of preconceived ideas. They just knew that they were suffering and they wanted a, a way to put an end to it. And so that's what he offered. When he told them to look at their breaths, they looked at their breaths. When he told them to stay there, they would do their best to stay there. And as for anticipating what was going to happen, he wouldn't encourage that kind of anticipation. There's a similar story about a John Sao. People come and Asked how to meditate, and he said, Okay, repeat the word Bhutto. And if they asked, What does Bhutto mean? He said, Don't ask. And if they asked, What's going to happen when I repeat it? He said, Don't ask, just do it. So he'd go back and do it. And then they would come and they would report the results. Now, if the results were not right, he would let them know that it was not right. They were doing something wrong. But if the results were good and they wouldn't know if the results were right, he wouldn't encourage that. He'd say, Well, just keep on doing it. Because even when you're right in the beginning of the practice, you're not fully right. If you were fully right, you'd be an arahant. There'd be no more suffering. But you're headed in the right direction, sort of between right and wrong. But the encouragement always was to look at what's actually happening in your mind as a result of what you're doing. In line with the Buddhist teachings that the Dharma is nourished by commitment. You really, really do it, and then you reflect. And the reflection is this. Is there any stress? If so, where? What's the nature of that stress? And what are you doing that's contributing to it? You can see this in the way the various levels of jhana develop. Again, people would get into these levels. The Buddha himself got into jhana the first time when he was a child. He had no idea what was happening. Didn't anticipate it, but that, that's where it was. 
So he tried that. And it wasn't like he'd been told by somebody that there were going to be four levels of jhana and you had to do this and do that. So what did he do? He got his mind into that state and he asked the question, is there still some stress here? And he realized it was in the directed thought and the evaluation. What happened if you dropped that? Because in the beginning, the directed thought and evaluation were necessary parts of getting the mind to settle down. Because otherwise, if you didn't direct your thoughts to the breath, it'd go someplace else. The mind has this tendency to talk to itself, so have it talk to itself about one thing. But there does come a point where you don't need to keep talking. In a John Fuang's image, it's like calling your water buffalo. When it comes, you don't have to keep calling it. It's there. So when the mind is there, you drop all that chatter and just stay with the perception of breath. And then you notice, is there still some stress here? You don't go too quickly through these levels. We're not trying to jump through jhana hoops. We're trying to observe our minds. And sometimes it takes a long time sitting with one thing to sense what's going on. And I'll give it that amount of time. Try to really settle in. Get some nourishment out of the concentration. Because that's what keeps you going. Until you get more sensitive. And then you begin to see, well, there's this thing that I do that I don't have to do, and I can get the mind even more still, more solid. And you just keep following it through. That's how the Buddha went through all the different levels of jhana and was able to navigate them. And then when he came to different knowledges, the question was, what does this knowledge have to do with the ending of suffering? Knowledge of his previous lives? Well, the question is, why? Why do we keep coming back to suffering again and again? Everything is so ephemeral, and yet we have so much craving for it. Then he saw the larger picture. He saw it was because of people's actions, which were their intentions based on their views. The question again was, what's the best use of this for putting it into suffering? He realized it was the lessons he had learned having to do with the power of karma in the present moment. So he focused back on the present moment. What am I doing right now? How do I understand what I'm doing right now? And what's the best way to understand it so that I could stop causing the suffering? That was how he gained awakening. He kept looking at what was happening and being very honest about the fact that yeah, there was some stress here. And then casting around to see what he could do to stop contributing to that. Until I finally discovered that the fact that there was the stress and suffering was totally dependent on what he was doing. That was why I was able to put it into it. So he learned by feeling his way and being very clear about what he was doing, very clear about the results, and very demanding in his judgment. Could it be possible that there would be something with no stress at all? So he found his way without anticipation. There was a desire, but he was also exploring. And as we practice, it's good that we try to adopt that mindset as well. There are lots of books there. I'm guilty of writing a fair number of them. But you're not here just to pit your mind into a mold. Or to say, yes, I see the truth of that, I see the truth of this, and think that you're done. In the forest tradition, they actually ask you to prove the Buddha wrong. This is how you get past this fact that we have the maps with us now. We sometimes like to think that the forest of Johns went out into the forest without any scholarly learning. They all had the basic concepts. They all were trained in the basic concepts. And they'd heard about the different levels of noble attainments. They'd heard about the different levels of jhana. This is all part of their background. 
So how did they not just try to fit into the background, fit into the concepts? And John Mun and John Mahabua, all of the Ajahns, would encourage their students, try to prove the Buddha wrong. And one of the questions, of course, is the Buddha talks about things being inconstant. Okay, is there something that is permanent, something that doesn't change? Find that in your mind. Look for it. So John Lee talks about finding things that are constant, easeful, and under your control in the mind. You can discover this with the practice of meditation. The concentration comes in, and you can get some really solid states of mind. And they're useful, one, because when you start questioning everything else, you're coming from a position of strength, a position of well-being, a position of confidence. You're not threatened by the inconstancy of other things, because you found something good. But how good is it? You keep on questioning, you keep on observing. And there will come a point where you say, well, this too has its inconstancy. But don't be too quick. Don't be in a hurry to come to that judgment. You've really got to test it. How far does it go? Only then can you say that you've really discovered something and not just try to fit yourself into a mold. Because after all, you are here to solve the problem of your own suffering. That's what matters. You're not here to gain brownie points. So be honest as you look at what you're doing, and be observant to see what the results are. This is why honesty and being observant were the qualities the Buddha looked for in students. My John Fung would use the word, be observant more than anything else in his meditation instructions. That and use your ingenuity. And part of being ingenious in the practice is realizing that there is this danger of just saying, I can recreate what's described in the text. Yes, I can see that everything arises and passes away. Well, why does it arise? After all, stream entry is not about arising, it's about origination. Where do these things come from? When the Buddha uses the word origination, he means causes that come from within the mind. Okay, what in your mind is giving rise to things? You're not just here watching a passing show. You're creating the show. You have a hand in it, and you want to detect that. So always bring a questioning attitude. And one way of escaping this tendency we have of putting ourselves into the mold is to see if we can break the mold. We learn a lot of good lessons that way, unexpected lessons, because a lot of discernment is unexpected. We can read the books, we can think about them, and if we get good books and our thinking is right, it can point us in the right direction. But it can't answer all the questions. And no matter how right your right views may be to begin with, there will be surprises on the path. So remember, right anticipation is not one of the factors of the path. We're here to explore and to learn. And if you have that attitude, you can keep yourself safe.